Hi, honey. Um, hey, guys. This is Melinda Clark, and I am joined by my beautiful daughter, C.G. Mirich. C.G. Mirich. Mm. And welcome to Beyond the O.C. for our Top 50 Countdown voted on by you, the fans. Last week was the Goodbye Girl, and this week is the Return of the Nana. But first, I'd like to start by uh, letting you all know there's a trigger warning. This episode contains sensitive material as we discuss sexual assault. So please check the show notes to skip these parts or join us on, if you prefer, join us on the next episode. Help is always available for anyone struggling with the trauma of sexual assault. RAIN is the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization and offers help to survivors. If you need to speak to someone, you can always call their hotline at 1-800-656-HOPE. So there's that. This is a, uh, well, it's an entertaining and also very dark episode. So uh, shall we get right into it? Because I'm curious what you what you think about it, CG. Yeah. Uh, so this episode is The Return of the Nana, directed by Ian Toynton and written by Josh Schwartz. Mm-hmm. Um I'm going to be so brutally honest. Why why is this in the top 50? <laughs> like, I never want to watch this episode ever again. Oh, interesting. Okay. Like, I- not not say anything against the acting. I think this, this episode is some of the best acting I've seen from some people. Okay. Nothing against the acting. Well. Why would anyone want to watch an episode full of like just people acting so so shitty Ah. again Hmm. like i hated this episode i'm gonna be honest like i i didn't like this episode you had a very strong strong reaction to it you know what's interesting is they don't we do trigger warnings now and i don't think they did this back then and and if and actually one of the things that i learned from our friends at um, keeping up with the cohen's i remember um because they have such i just love Honestly, you guys, if you, I'm going to say this again. They have one of the best podcasts about the OC. But um, Dylan came up with the uh, trivia that this episode was preempted by President Bush um, talking about Social Security. So this, so the next week they had to play this episode first and then this episode right after this back to back. And so a lot of people didn't tune. We So the ratings were kind of lower on this episode. And the regular viewers probably tuned in for the episode after not knowing what happened because there's like a million extra viewers on the next one. So anyway, well, just yeah, read, read the, we already got into it before you even read the synopsis of the episode, but okay. Sandy, Seth and Ryan travel to Miami, Florida during spring break to visit banana and Seth's old buddies at leisure world. I don't know if it's a leisure world. I just like to say that when the Nana drops a bombshell about her impending marriage to a younger man back in Newport, Kirsten is happily or is she left on her own to grapple with her feelings for Carter? Zach, Mr. Chef Boyardee, invites Summer to a home cook gnocchi dinner at his house. Marissa hangs out with Trey after helping him get a job, but things take a dark turn when Trey misinterprets Marissa's kindness and does the unthinkable. So we'll get to that kind of at the end of our discussion, right? Um, I think we should focus on what is going on um you know, with the boys and the shenanigans and uh, that opening scene where Seth basically says it's like the end of the uh, end of an era because Bright Eyes has two top 10 singles mm-hmm. and it's like people are catching up to me, the arrogance of him, which is kind of, it's kind of endearing. But you guys, you and Rachel said that that was a nod to real Adam Brody and real Josh Schwartz who, who right. thought their music taste was superior and people were, people were finally liking what they liked and considered special for a long time. You know exactly what conversations Adam had with Josh. And he just puts them right into the script. Yeah. And it is interesting that you mentioned, yeah, um, both CG and I went back and listened to the episode that Rachel and I did. And those were back in the days when Rachel and I were going scene by scene. You know, we were trying to, you know, do different things. And we didn't really get a chance to really d- discuss because it takes a long time to go scene by scene. Um, but we didn't really discuss the, uh, the storylines in, in depth. And um, I was also in Puerto Rico. And then there's this big, at one point, there's this big ch- uh, part in it. Yeah, where, you just disappear. Well, and you, we didn't and we didn't let anyone know that I, I had no Wi-Fi. So Rachel just uh, was reading. <laughs> Did you notice that? I figured that it had something to do with that. Because I, I was on a walk listening to it. And I was like, 
Wait, I haven't heard mom talk in like three minutes. Like, why is Rachel just like? She had to just do because the the Wi-Fi was not good in Puerto Rico and I could just dropped out. So uh, there's there's that. That mystery was. Well, so the Nana calls and I think it's funny. I think it's like typical like mother-in-law doesn't like the daughter-in-law, like the Nana calls and says, like, oh, you want to talk to my mom? And the Nana and Kirsten are both like, no, no, no. Uh, which I thought was funny. Yeah, Sandy gets the phone and he's like, hey, mom. And and Seth says, why does he talk so loud? And she said, they're a family of screamers. And I thought, hey, <laughs> Sandy, what, what do you think? Look, we are well known for being loud. Your dad, myself, Yeah, I was about to say the Mirichs are a family of uh, yeller, like just loud. Just loud talking. Have, it's kind of not an insecurity because I kind of don't really care, but I've met people and like getting to know them, they'll be like, why are you talking so loud? I'm like it's not because my parents do. I'm like I just, I don't know. I just talk loud. Like well, I'm incapable of being quiet. Well, okay. So this is something that I've, I've been working on not talking so loud because I've learned if I have my little kitty in my lap, then he, yep. he gets up annoyed because cats have such good hearing. So it's uh, every once in a while, I'm like, if I, if we do this to each other, it's like, I can hear you anyway. But I thought, I thought about us cause we're a family of loud talkers, but anyway, he, he lets them know that they're going to Miami and, and, and because she's getting married. Obviously, you watched the recap, but so we know that Marissa and Ryan, like, just got back together or, like, just kissed or something. Yeah, they're starting their relationship. So in the last couple episodes, they've just gotten back together. Yes. Okay. So Ryan doesn't want to leave because, obviously, like, I understood Ryan. I'm like, oh, I just kissed her. I'm back with her. Why would I want to jet off somewhere for a week? And then, obviously, Trey just came back. So he doesn't want to leave Trey alone. He says, I, I thought it was kind of, though, I was kind of annoyed when he said, um, I feel weird leaving Trey alone. And I thought, well, why? And then I, you know, and then, no, of course. No, I, I think he's smart. Like, well, Trey, it, yeah. Trey just got out of jail of, like, mm-hmm. he's worried he's going to get back into trouble. Yeah. But but you see how excited Seth is. And so he's so excited. We're to Miami. We're going to Miami. And then, and then. I love the nervous Jewish Sandy trying to figure out like, you know, uh, Kirsten's like, what is going on with you? And he's like, look, I love my mother, but who else could, you know, he's, he's um, all up in arms about this. And of course his spidey sense is, is, is on. So when Ryan goes over to see Marissa and just want to point out how gorgeous Misha looks in this, I mean, there really was, she was wearing this beautiful top and and I know Rachel and I said that, but I watched it again and it really is just breathtaking. And I thought that they did that kind of throughout this show. Just there were little, there was fashion and hair and makeup things that just made her angelic. Because as we come to understand that there's this predator prey kind of theme going on, I feel like throughout this, Um, because I think most Mm. of us know what was going on who people who've rewatched it, but obviously it was kind of a, a uh, surprise to you, but uh, yeah, you know, Ryan decides to go. Right. And thinks it's going to be just fine. And she says, I'll look after Trey because there, Marissa, we discovered is kind of a nurse nightingale. She likes to take care of people. Yeah. So then we go to summer at her house. So funny. Dun, the, dun, 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 dun. I, like a full on Rocky boxing scene. Yeah, I have the time. was funny. But and so once again, good. Seth has done something wrong. Yeah, they were at the um, comic book party up in LA and she was made to feel like less than. And it's just yeah. been going through this thing with Zach and, and Seth and, and Reed and the comic book. And she was really embarrassed. Like, you know, it was so much so that she's, he says, she's like, I need a break. And he's like, oh, well, then good. I'm going to Miami, you know, just. It's almost like Seth didn't, he didn't seem to care that much that they needed a break. He was like, really? Kind of like, okay, fine. Yeah. Did he? Did he seem like he cared to you? Not enough. Like for someone who's like, oh, I want to take a pause. I don't think he cared enough. And I think that is like his downfall. Like with the whole Anna thing, he didn't care enough about Summer. Like I feel like he doesn't, he's just like, Oh, I'm awesome. So self-involved. Like 
she loves me. It's fine. But it's like, no, it's not always like that, buddy. Well, I think it's a, you know, when you pull characters apart on a TV show, I think we need a good reason. And I think Summer has a really good reason. Yeah. And because then when we see her, when, when Zach shows up and she's doing boxing again and she gives she him one, one of the best punches yeah. It, it looked good. I mean, it sold it. I and on the podcast, Rachel said, "Oh, I really hit him," and I believed her. But she's like, "No, no, I didn't." Yeah, Summer Dex Zach in the face, best punch. You just said you totally believed Rachel on the other podcast. Totally Dex him in the face. I thought it, it like. I think you were right that they could have added like a noise. No, they definitely added a, a sound. They definitely am, added a sound effect, and uh, but. There's so much about Zach, and then he cooks her this amazing dinner and all this, but, uh, well, the gnocchi or gnocchi or something. There's something about Zach that's, it's a great character because there's so many qualities about him that are better than Seth. And I think it keeps the audience yeah. guessing, like, why is she with Seth? Like, what is it? And, you know, they're destined to be together, obviously, we know, to the end of the show, but but there's so many qualities about Zach, but I think we all need to remember that Zach is, um, and we find out later, but he's kind of, he's manipulative, but he knows he does exactly what uh, Summer needs. He's, he does his actions and his words are all about what Summer needs. And, you know, ultimately he's always like, I'm a water polo, water polo player. I'm not a good guy because he's always been manipulative. I think uh, to, because he, he knows when to swoop in, knows exactly what to say. He's calculated. And, and he's calculated and he's always been that way. And so, yeah, in, in, the, in that regard. So, but let's go back to Miami because the boys show up in Miami and the music department spent all this money on getting, you know, the Will Smith song, Welcome to Miami. And that fabulous, I mentioned it in the other podcast, that Miami Vice montage, which mm -hmm. I thought was so funny because... The reason for this entire episode, CG, is simply, and this is from Josh, simply to get Adam Brody with the um, with the Nana and the buddies, the old buddies, the Jewish buddies, mm. because Josh's grandma is the Nana. He's played shuffleboard with, you know, these these guys. This was a simply the whole episode was based on. The success of the strip, the Vegas one, re, uh, re repeating that and getting Adam with these guys, which I think is the best, most entertaining part of the whole episode of him playing shuffleboard, winning, it's so funny, doing the, doing the victory lap. So you agree that's funny? Yeah. Yes? So he, <laughs> that's a yes. yeah. He's so he, when he head. walks and sits down at the table with them, yeah, that's funny. And he's like, they're like. The old men are like, oh, are you taking this medicine? How's your back? And they're like asking him all these questions. It kind of reminded me. I don't know if you remember when I was younger, I used to do my old man impression. <laughs> yeah. That was kind of like I would say it was Ozzy Osbourne because I was young and didn't know who Ozzy Osbourne was. But I'd be like, <laughs> where's my taco? Do you remember, do you remember that? Yeah, I used to do. I used to pretend you had a cane and walk around. Yeah. And do you remember we actually I went on the Sharon Osbourne um, talk show and you were in the audience wearing your pink little clogs and I really? did an, I did an Ozzy Osbourne impression to her she's like I hear you imitate my husband and I was like oh girl Sharon or whatever it was the dog Sharon something he used to talk about his dogs or something and I don't I don't think she was pretty um she wasn't impressed at all yeah. well, <laughs> but you, were, you were this cute little like three-year-old four-year-old in the audience Wearing your, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. Door that's yeah, floor. That's anyway. funny. The fact that, like, I think it's even funnier when Sandy's like, "Okay, I'm gonna go have lunch with my mom." It's like, keep an eye on him. Like he says to Ben or um, to Ryan, he's like, "Oh, yeah. keep an eye on him." He's like, he doesn't even have this many friends at school. What's going yeah. on? Yeah, I thought uh, that was funny. Well, and then you know, so when the boys leave, and you know, basically, there's all kinds of shenanigans and fun crazy things going on on the East coast. Our ladies are in turmoil on the West coast. And I thought it was so Sandy leaves and Kirsten jumps to the phone. Well, and, oh no, before, 
I want to point out. So she walks out and says bye to them and whatever, like bye in the driveway. And she walks back in the house. And you guys didn't mention this at all in the last episode. And I was like, huh. When she walks back into the house, I I know it's editing, but the echo of her footsteps goes click, click, click. And it's so eerie and hollow and empty. And I was like, that's very like cinematic, artistic. Like she closes the door, takes a few little steps walking back into the house. And it's like the silent echo of her footsteps. You know, that's like a little foreshadowing for like what's going to happen to her later on. But I also thought it was very artistic. I don't know. I got to say, though, whose job that is. I think the director fully. But, no, no. Well, they add sound in the end. They, and well, yeah, yeah. But they fully. added that in to make it sound like really echoey. You make and, a like, point. Empty. Any wife or mother who's constantly a caretaker taking care of people and the door closes and she has the house all to herself. There's a bit of like. But there's a bit of happiness, I think. Although we know that there's been this. So, or is it? So she gets. I don't think there's any happiness in Kirsten right now. She. I don't don't think there's an ounce. (laughs) I'm saying she thinks she's got this. Like, oh my gosh, I have this weekend away because she goes. She runs to the Newport Group and it's like we can work because she's lost connection with Sandy. So there's this wall between them. They can't break through when he went to Rebecca and now she's found this connection with somebody that she's working close to and, and it's bringing out her addiction to alcohol. And for some reason, that's where she's finding the connection with, with Carter. And he drops this bombshell that he's actually leaving. And you can see on, on, on Kelly's acting that her heart just sinks. And, but then she invites him over for dinner, which is kind of a womp womp. And they end up having this The dinner. second she said, why don't you come over? I'll cook. I went, fuck no. <laughs> no, Kirsten. You got angry. Did you? It's like, you dumb bitch. No offense, Kelly. <laughs> Whoa. It's but like... I was like, <sighs> Well, you know, I think, like, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think that they have a better they have better chemistry i love billy campbell by the way but they have better chemistry than sandy and rebecca did and this design like the men in her life are disappointing her we we mentioned in the last episode the goodbye girl how that she learned that her father was a criminal and that's disappointing and now we're like a full year later and look where she is and having you know completely ir- irrational thought and drinking tons of wine and kissing carter which was you could see even though it was just the one kiss there was like passion behind it and then she says i have to say goodbye so when you were watching it or kids your age were watching it and as teenagers i I'm, I'm sure we mentioned this last time that the adult storylines are like let's get to the kids let's get to the kids but man they are done so well and there's this is what makes good drama because to see Kirsten, they never ever wanted them to, or it says in the book that Kelly was really concerned about how far they were going to let Sandy and Kirsten go with these um, respective. Because yeah. if you break up, like in the book, they say if you break up Sandy and Kirsten, like yeah. that's crossing a line. No, but I was just like, she knows this is bad, and that's why I think she doesn't have any happiness in her because. She, why does that keep happening? I need to stop okay. talking with my hands. <laughs> the thumbs. thumbs up keeps showing up. It happens all the time when we FaceTime too. And I don't know why. I'm not, I'm not even doing a thumbs up gesture. Well. <laughs> why is it happening to me and not you? It's okay. Because I'm like, I don't think she has an ounce of happiness because Carter is the only place she finds like a reprieve from all of this shit going on. But so she she thinks that's like happiness, but it's actually distraction. Right. I don't think her and Carter actually have a connection. I don't think she actually loves him. I just think Mm. he's to distract her from everything that's going on. And then he leaves. So it becomes the alcohol. But I'm just like, girl, you you know, if he comes over, you're going to do something you're going to regret. So why even invite him over in the first place? And that goes into this you know, this inability to, you know, you know, 
imp the impulse control or or the fact that they they've spent so much time together and I just think there's she found connect she wasn't getting something at home and I think human beings what do they say that the opposite of addiction is connection and she's although she's in something that her feelings are allowing her to go into a place that makes her feel good even though it's false she's leaning into something that feels good even though so there's like Ill illogical irrational feelings going on anyway um let's get back to the what's going on in miami so they're there and all of a sudden mary sue mary sue jamie the jamie most King. gorgeous woman i've seen ever oh really do you know jamie I, King? I, yeah well yeah, i yeah. mean i've like seen some of heart of dixie and stuff and okay I looked her up as I was reading it and she's like 45 now. And I was like, wow, she looks yeah. good. Yeah. Cute little country girl. Um, <laughs> uh, asks Seth to As an agenda. Yeah. Asks him to be her partner in, dan in a dance competition because she needs $5,000. So she doesn't have to ask her grandmam to pay for her tuition for college. And it would make her grandma, Mary Ellen, so happy. Can I make a point? Well, and then of course, she, so Seth loses and they get to this um, MTV type thing. Did you know, have you noticed on, it was like on TikTok and it's, it's out there that Miami has broken up. They've done this huge campaign. We, we're breaking up with you. And they're ta you're talking to the audience. Basically, they're saying, we're breaking up with you, spring break. Don't show up. Um, there's curfews, $100 parking tickets, major fines. Don't show up. We don't want you here on the beach because apparently it's just gotten ridiculous. Wow. Miami, literally this year, the campaign is do not show up. I mean, this will, I think it'll, spring break will have happened by the time this comes out, but it's all over. Like Florida is like, don't come here. People are, it's like drunk, huh. violence, whatever is going on. Yeah. That's Can't what's going say on, I've right? ever been to Florida. Have you ever done a spring break? I have, but we went to Myrtle Beach. Ah, Right. Yeah. Well, it, I think it's, I've never done one like this, but because MTV started doing this in like 1986, these big things. And I think they ended only yeah. like 10 years ago doing these huge um, parties. I mean, like, this. like Vegas in the summer and spring break is still like this. Like our, my cousin like has been to Vegas a couple times in the last couple months. And it's like this, like that party is like what the clubs look like still yeah. currently like in Vegas. Yeah. No, they, they're the all day. day pool parties. They're like all yeah. day nightclubs. And so of course we've got, uh, you know, these, th this amazing thing, Brett Harrison, um, Adam's birth best friend. We mentioned that he, a lot of people didn't know that he was big funny guy on the show. And then he's playing, um, Oh, what's the character of the, of the VJ that he's playing. I don't know. I'm forgetting his name. Whoever the main DJ a is. A bananas, yeah. a bananas, a bananas. Anyway. Um, and the, and the actress from the real, um, the Valley, the real. Uh, Sherman Oaks, the real Valley. Valley. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. That's you. That's Let's. You. Yeah. <laughs> I'm from Sherman Oaks, the real Valley. And then T.I. performs and. Bring them uh, out, bring them out, bring them out, out, bring them yeah. out. I had a dance to that when I was on the dance team in high school. Oh, yeah, you boop, did some boop, good boop. stuff. Bring them out, bring them out. Boop, so, of boop, course, boop. it turns into, it's not a dance thing. It's this, this grossed me out. It grossed whip me out in the first cream podcast. It grossed licking. So, licking whipped cream off the chest, torso, and then finishing by eating the cherry out. Sticky. 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 And this is something that Seth is going to do. And it turns out, as he's preparing to do this, and Ryan's getting a bottle of water, this was my favorite guest star of the show. The, this the, uh, the this Bob Jones. made me laugh. He was good, wasn't he? I just thought well, he was like the best it character. It made me laugh because I think they're trying to reference like Brigham Young University or something. Bob like, Jones is a real, but it's a real university. It's a real university. What? It, yeah, Bob Jones University. It's a. Um, they wouldn't look, say a real name of a school. Mm hmm. They did. He's like, yeah. It is a real school. Where? I think it's South Carolina. No way. I thought they were trying to reference like Brigham Young University in Utah. Well, kind of. No, it's in, yeah, Bob Jones University, Greenville, South Carolina. Huh. Private, nonprofit, four-year. It's a evangelical university. So, yeah, Josh, all these references real. are. 
Yeah, all these references. He's kind Anyways. Of he was he was Anyways. good. And he's like, are those your buddies? Like my Bible study buddies, and we're gonna we're gonna get that Rough little skinny up. sinner. That t- I did laugh though because he it's all these big tough dudes at a Bible university, a really religious university. And how did they rough set set up? They just cover him in whipped cream. They don't beat him up. They don't rob him. They don't punch him. He's just covered in whipped cream. And that's how what they considered roughing him up. They didn't beat him up or anything. I thought that was funny. That's actually a good point because basically we end with them running on stage because yeah. he wins the contest and they're surrounded and we cut to him just, we don't know what happened. We don't know if they got, but He's now just you're covered you're in whipped cream. He says, too bad we can never tell anyone. So that was on purpose like because he says, I can never tell anyone what happened. But what was it? Like, there's something else in there yeah. that they didn't want us well, to know. But, like, in all of the past things, like, you see Ryan standing there, and he's, like, there to save the day with Seth. In all the past, like, altercations like this, have been fighting. it's been fighting. And Ryan's had to punch all these guys and gets a black guy and whatever. But I, mm-hmm. like, I'm just, these guys just covered Seth in whipped cream. It's a really harmless, like, His hair is way to teeth. get him back. Like, <laughs> they just sprayed him with whipped cream. You know, like, and of course, we talked about how the, well, and then, of course, in the book, I was reading more on page, um, I, I wrote it down, page 209, they talk about um, Miami, that the kids were at the height, the height of their fame and shooting on a public street was you could see people in the background kind of staring because they can only mark off so much. And, and that um, Seth uh, or Seth Adam actually did. It's probably whipped cream. It's not dairy. You mean but sha- he had shaving to, cream? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Wh- uh, shaving cream um, all over his body. But that one point, Lisa Cochran, our line producer mentioned in the book that and I didn't, I didn't know this part that the, the van with everybody took off and she realized that Adam was standing next to her and they had to hail a cab because it was, it was, and mayhem. he was so covered in shape. <laughs> well, no, he probably, they probably got him down oh. by that point. But, but, uh, but yeah, they said walking into a club was just mayhem. They had yeah. 150 cops to do this and it was, you know, those aren't easy things to do. So, so yeah, no, it must've been like, like crazy. Rachel, of course, got herself there to be, to promote yeah. a club. Yeah. Yep. All that kind of stuff. But uh, so in the meantime, Sandy will mention this. Sandy, sure enough, gets to meet the guy who's 12 years her bag. junior. And and Sleazy. while she goes to Tinkle, that made me laugh that she said Tinkle. Uh, he says, you know, he, he does this passive. Well, I don't know if it's passive aggressive. It's oh, it's pretty, totally passive aggressive. Well, it's it's pretty it's a threat. Essentially, yeah. he's like, you know, and he's playing it. And then I, I just love this is once again, I always Sandy scenes to me are always so satisfying because he says to her, uh, he says, you know, first of all, I don't know. This is the first time we've heard that he's bought her a condo in Sarasota. And and it must have happened off screen, you guys, because the last we saw, she was like in the Bronx and was sick. So it must have yeah. happened off screen. This, is, this was also kind of random for me, like the Nana. And then we never hear from her again, do we? No, we don't. And yeah, but 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 the fact that he says, I, you know, so my FBI and, and my cop buddies, my FBI buddies, they say, let's run a background check on this guy, which is great because a background check obviously you would show up something. I mean, everyone could do it nowadays, but, but it's enough to make him take off with the excuse that he has a malpractice thing and needs to take off. But, but I, I, I'm going to say this again. And I said that in the last podcast, Linda Lavin is one of the um, treasures of the American um, actors that we've ever had. She's just this lovely, lovely actor. And she was hurt. Like, what did you say? But then she realizes, you know, there's a part of me that knew. And even though she's such a strong, powerful woman, she literally was like, how could this man love me for me? It must be something. But I need my son to kind of, I know that he'll do this. Yeah. Ultimately, she she knew. And um, it was touching. So thank you, Linda Lavin. We did ask her to be on the podcast. I don't know if we ever said this, but um, she declined. Uh, so I don't know. She used to kind of, I don't know if she, I don't know if she had a good time or not. I couldn't find anything about her talking about it, but, uh, anyway, she was great. Uh, she yeah. did a good Love job. You. 
So now let's get to um, the Marissa Trey. No, uh, we didn't. Summer and Zach. Oh, right, right, right. Mother. So, <laughs> there, I'm. See, I'm glad you're here to, you know, rein me in. So they're making ganaki <laughs> um, and eating it. And of course, Zach's like, oh, I'm just going to turn on some TV while, while I make, make the gnocchi. gnocchi. And, and we course, know what's going to happen. Yeah. Oh, I have no idea but what then is when they're coming. E- they're eating and it's like this delicious and I'm going to, uh, this delicious meal. And Rachel was just, uh, the Chef Boyer D comment that I made is because Rachel and I were giggling about how sa- how how Zach well, no, was you guys said he hat. also looks like the the Muppet in the chef hat. Right. The, the Chef Boyer D and then the I was and I was saying beep, 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 but that's a different yeah. character. Beep, beep, beep. And yeah, so but uh but anyway, that was uh But she says oh, what kind of freak would do this? Ew. She says Lo Ew. and behold, she sees Seth licking whipped cream off a pretty blonde girl. Who yeah. thought that was gonna happen? Yeah. I had no idea. Wow. And she instantly little... makes out and slams one into um, Zach, which is exactly what he wanted to happen. I don't think yep. he was expecting it, but, you know. Yep. So that happens. She's... A little conniving. <laughs> Could you imagine, though? Rachel always admits that she was like, I had to keep an eye on, on Brody. <laughs> what? And she was always actual like. actual Brody? Yeah. She was like, I need to go there. I need to be there. To oh. keep an eye on him. She was so funny. But uh, but I feel like that kind of dynamic was written into the show. Uh, so anyway, yes. Marissa, in the meantime, you know, decides that she's going to knock on Trey's door uh, and say, hey, I'm Ryan's out of town, but I'm here and I'm going to help you get a job. And he answers at the door in this, this blanket or a towel or whatever. And... Uh, as she He's drives with, um, Jess. what's her name? Jess. And they're doing lines and, and drink or whatever. And uh, she she kind of pokes him and says, oh, yeah, right. You and Marissa, never. Yeah. And, and then she helps him get a job and she's, you know, doing all the things that Marissa does. And you can yeah. see, and she decides, you know, let's, let's, we get the job at the bait shop. Let's celebrate and uh, make margaritas, bring the guac and bring... She brings the notebook to watch a movie and one thing leads to another. She's, she feels so drunk that she wants to go outside and he's done some blow and ultimately he wants her to howl at the moon and do all these things and, and then kind of starts aggressing her and she instantly says no and it just instantly gets out of control and he assaults her. And she gets away by hitting him with a stick. So not a stick, a massive effing you know, piece driftwood. of driftwood that driftwood. makes him bleed. It's an interesting thing, yeah. Because for me, from the first time I saw it till now, it's so disturbing because it's very realistic. Yeah. And I think you know, as a female, there are so many times where. You know, they talk about, and and I know we have some statistics before that like one in five women have been assaulted. It might be, those are the numbers we just know. And it's oftentimes more often than people that we know. And just by being nice to someone in, you know, obviously there was extenuating circumstances with maybe who he is, the, the risk. The resentment towards wealthy people, the anger at the world. I'm not, this is not victim blaming or anything. This isn't like um, making excuses. I'm trying to understand the character and how he says, you know, what you think I'm better than me and all these things that come out that he's not able to control and show who he really is. It's an interesting thing to look back and say. No, but but this is who he really is. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That, that, that gets magnified and like... So, so these ideas that, you know, there've been so many times where I have so many guy friends, but there've been a couple times in my life where I'm hanging out with a guy friend multiple times. And all of a sudden this person would say, I want to kiss you. And I'm like, what? No. And then they go, come on, why not? And it's like, because that's not what I thought we were friends. And that nothing, it wasn't serious in that way, but there have been plenty of times where you feel safe. I felt safe with somebody 
and to come to find out that they have different thoughts and it's, mm-hmm. and I think, you know, Marissa, and I think for someone like Trey, he really was in jail. He's never, ever had someone this nice. And all of a sudden at some point, probably maybe from the moment he saw, I don't know when, when this all started with him, but, but, uh, what were your initial thoughts? That was my thoughts. I mean, the like they portrayed it really well and like their acting was great. I thought both of them did a really great job and you can see like immediately after like Trey knows he fucked up and I think it was great that the direct writers, directors, whatever had Ryan calling and that's when he re- Trey's like, oh fuck, like I'll never have the same relationship with Ryan again. I think it was really well done. There's nothing against yeah. the acting, nothing against the storyline. I just think what makes me really upset was that Reddit post you sent me where someone said Melissa or Melissa. We can get into those. You want to get into those? Yeah. Okay. Let's get into the deep dive because I guess I'm switching over a little bit. Uh, This isn't one that we have included here, but it's one you sent me because you were saying you were looking through Reddit about comments on this episode and someone said Marissa led Trey on. Oh, there was a Reddit thread. that made me... (laughs) so angry. Yeah. There's so many comments under that post where people are like, "Mm, okay, so you're a victim blamer. Like Mm -hmm. people were saying there was being nice to someone does not equate to I want to hook up with you. I think there's so many. Yeah, there's so many things wrong with that. Anyone who said that this was out of Trey's character. Marissa let him on. Like, she made him think she wanted it. I go to fucking hell. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. but. there's. I think there's something to be said. And and obviously. I'm very vulgar this episode. But I'm this made, like, after I read yeah. that comment, I got angry. Yeah, because I think there's, there's, I don't think any. And now, there's a problem in society when a woman being nice to a guy is leading him on leading him on to what now if a guy says hey do you like me and she says oh no 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 not in that way i do as a friend that's different than than somebody grabbing assaulting and really violently going after her you know there's a way to um ask if if um, i'm getting some mixed signals but what trey did or what trey or what we're portraying here, there is no excuse whatsoever. There's no, there's no right. There's no defending. There's no, but, but all we can do here is try to examine possibly what the character is going through, because this is very realistic. And I don't know, ultimately that I found a quote from Josh when he said that we knew that the arrival of Trey, we're going to do something to build some kind of Ryan versus Trey with Marissa in the middle and how that would play out we continue to discuss throughout the year. And obviously this is the beginning. The whole reason Trey was brought on was to have this kind of drama that Stephanie Savage said, it will never be easy for Ryan and Marissa. Yeah. And someone on Reddit, uh, the username is Trizzy MW said, Trey had potential to develop as a strong character further on in the series. They always put Marissa in the most dangerous situations and they used Trey as a poor reason for it. Which I disagree. I think this is something like this was going to happen with Trey's character, no matter what. It had to. You know, they're like Josh said, they're building. There's going to be a Ryan Trey thing in this show. There's never any harmony when it comes to it's never easy. Like, I don't think Trey would ever be redeemable in this show. I don't think he had a storyline that was going in the direction of becoming buddies with Ryan and fixing the relationship. I don't think that was ever in the cards for his character. Well, and uh, what, what Trizzy MW said, um, my thought was yes and no to the comment, because basically this buildup of this storyline ended up being the, what Josh thinks is the best season finale. I agree. um, It is. SNL skits have been written about that season finale. 
And that, I hope that episode is in the top 50 because that's a good episode. Yeah. So, but the thing that's kind of a shame is that what we discovered is that as they were bringing in subsequent seasons in season two and three, when they were bringing on these other guest actors, um, the Lindsay's, the Zach's and the Alex's, the, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting all the, all the names of the characters that they There's weren't as, they weren't as widely, um, they weren't as widely accepted by the audience as say Anna and Luke, because, because the show started with them. And Josh was saying that they learned that to keep introducing these new characters on a show, on this particular up show didn't do so well, but for some reason, Trey was a great addition. And I think what this person is trying to say, they had to use Trey to do it so that he's such a bad guy that, you know, just when some, I think the audience kind of liked him and wanted mm. to see him do well and redeem himself. And then to put him in this way, it was upsetting. So I kind of, that's, yeah. that's why I said yes and no, because he did serve a purpose. Guest stars are always there to serve our, our heroes or our main characters. Yeah. Well, someone else on Reddit for season Wahin, Wahin, um, for season Wahin, uh, uh-huh. maybe, yeah. maybe. Uh, They say it genuinely follows through that he got fucked up and thought Marissa was into him, then got angry when she didn't reciprocate his advances. I think the way his character was set up actually made it very believable and realistic. Yeah, that's that's like what I was trying to say, because I don't I don't know. As I when I watched the show for the first time, I don't remember thinking Trey was going to redeem himself. Like I thought he was brought in for drama. His character is always drama. His character is it made me nervous. Up. Yeah. Like he can't do anything good. Anytime he's in a scene, I was like, what is he gonna do? He obviously doesn't know how to take care of himself. Like he's been in and out of trouble. Like I never saw the potential for him to redeem himself. And I think that's why I said like the last scene, both Misha and Logan. Logan. They were phenomenal and they did it really, really well. And I think Logan was able to do it so well because because Trey's character was already like so messed up and it wasn't like he had to do a 180. Like it was just the way Trey was going. It was it it was just who Trey was. And yeah. Yeah, I think there's so, you know, there I'm taking a page out of the book too, because I wanted to this is something that I thought was interesting. Um you know, Stephanie had mentioned these are before the days of um, intimacy coordinators. And Misha had always been a, she loved the drama, she dramatic roles and, and meaty roles. And um, Stephanie's memory of it is that Misha was excited for the storyline to have a great heavy storyline. And, you know, when, when you open a script and you see you know, what's going to happen to your character as an actor. You're like, wow, this is going to be great. This is challenging. Misha did quote and say there were varying degrees of how comfortable she was in all of this. And the actual physicality of the scene when she drops to the sand was jarring and shocking. And, and I was so scared and I felt like I'm, I'm coming from my own point of view of, as an actor, you want these great storylines. You want these intense, dramatic, as as difficult as they are to portray, you want these things to play. Now, however, when you get into, it's an interesting thing when you say, okay, I'm going to play these things. I wonder if it actually, because I've had plenty of times in my career where I did something thinking like, I'm a brave actor because you're taught as to be brave, whether it's, you know, to, to, to risk things, to go there, to not be embarrassed, to, to, to do difficult things, whether it's the subject matter or being, or nudity or violence, whatever those things are, we want to face them head on. But there are times that once you've done them, you might have some repercussions or have some feelings. And we don't, I don't know what Misha felt or how it ended up being, but she said there's, I didn't want to get into it. And there's varying degrees of how she felt comfortable in all of that, because as you, you do these things and then, you know, there were, there were times where I did a few things. Yeah. I think even with an intimacy coordinator, like in today's time, filming anything like that is going to be hard. Like even with an intimacy coordinator and you know, all of 
the counseling that you can get through it and the steps you can take, I think no matter what, no matter how like well, like well seasoned of an actor you are, how experienced or anything like filming really intense, raw, real things like that is going to be hard. Well, and you don't, the thing is you hear about actors who really, really go deep and they, they, they will say, you know, at the end of shooting, you don't drop it. If you've yeah. had a, a a very, very deep, all day long emotional thing, you don't just drop it. It took like when, when when Marissa's character passed, I felt that for about three months afterwards because I was playing it all the time and you took it home with you. And, and uh, these things can stick. This is like a very interesting point that nobody really talks about. Like, how did, did that experience, how do you feel? How does Mindy feel? How does Misha feel? How does the actor feel after you have to, you go through these things? Because, um, yeah, I think it's just a really good to point out that we never, because you, we're training our brains. Our brains get tricked into actually believing it's happening. Not necessarily this. I don't know. I'm not speaking for Misha, but, but you actually go there to a place because we want it to be as realistic as possible. We don't want to be pretending. We want to make it real. Anyway, that's my, um, that's that was one of the observations that I said thought about um, because it's uh, she did mention it. So let's get to a couple of these other ones. Oh, somebody said lavishness best eight three 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 Reddit um, on Reddit said when exactly did Trey become infatuated with Marissa? Was it earlier when she scolded him for lying to Brian, or did it happen in this episode when she visits him and his new house at his new house and helps him find the job? I think it gr was gradual or I think the moment he saw her because she's so stunning that he probably was jealous of Ryan. I think he's been jealous of Ryan. His this whole thing, the is second he gets out of jail, the whole thing is about him being jealous of Ryan. He has this house with this family. Mm -hmm. He live. he has money. He has a hot girlfriend. Like yep. he's jealous of everything. Yeah. He is jealous of everything. So I, my perspective on it is like, I don't know if he was infatuated with Marit. Like, yes, he liked Marissa. He was infatuated with Marissa. But I think he saw Marissa as the one thing Ryan has that he could potentially take. He can't take the house. He can't take the family. He can't. I think he saw Marissa there and he was like, wow, maybe I can, sh you know, like make her mine. Like, I think you see that more in this episode, but I think that's what she represents is the one, the one thing that maybe Trey can take away from Ryan. And also the fact that Ryan's out of town and they're spending this time together and it's just us, all of a sudden those moments become very special in your mind. And, and the, combination of the alcohol and the cocaine and the being on the beach and he literally says I can do anything with you and I feel so good in this false you know dopamine rush that he's having but at the same time this spewing of what you think you're better than me you know and and th that comes from a very deep uh, abuse by his family because he wasn't good enough uh, and the fact that he's in jail that he's a fuck up he's a screw up all of those things are magnified by what Ryan has and what he can't have. And uh, now I just thought it was really well done as, as, as painful as it, as it was. So mm -hmm. there's a couple little things that we should say um, from Reddit. What somebody said, okay, I'm not going to N F G N F G N F G 12. What does that mean? <laughs> no anyway, idea. what a weird episode. There you go. Last time we saw the Nana, she was in the Bronx with cancer. And now she's magically in Florida with no explanation. And I, and I wrote, and when did Seth have time to make all these friends? These are these continuity issues because like Seth, we're, we're supposed to believe that Seth actually um, made these friends or that she's had right. this retirement home. Like she and, lived somewhere else a year yeah. ago. Yeah, and that he's made so some things happen off screen. We're just gonna yeah. say that. So they but, he, they must have visited Florida quite a few times. Yeah, uh, just didn't make any episodes about it. So I wanted to. I just just before we uh, recorded, uh, a comment came on YouTube to from Kate from Kim Ainsworth. It's her birthday today. Happy birthday! And she wrote, "This wasn't my favorite episode." Same Kim. There you go. 
The next three were some of the best of the whole show. It is also 20 years today since the OC started airing here over in England. I only remember it because it was my 13th birthday. Thank you for your comment, Kim, and happy, happy birthday. Uh, we had a couple voicemails that I wanted to play. And just because I think it's, it's really nice to hear your voices. And this whole podcast is um, we're trying to, you know, uh, it's all content motivated by you all. This voicemail was from Lou. Hello, girls. Thank you for having my message on the podcast. Um, big fan of the show. Uh, this episode, uh, there's so much going on, and I feel it's like such an important piece of the puzzle of how everything develops after. Um, in a way, I kind of see it like the beginning of the end uh, with everything that goes on between Marissa and Trey. Uh, but there's so many things going on, like the Nana uh, being stood up and, um, and, and Kirsten and Carter. And I was so angry at Seth. Like, uh, it's just so frustrating. Um, yeah, how, uh, you know, he got caught up being silly once more, doing set shenanigans. Uh, but I love the episode, and I love the show, and I want to hear your thoughts about it. Thanks, Lou. Yeah, I love that she said Seth just being like, ugh, because I think this whole episode is full of, ugh. <laughs> every single, almost every single character besides, like, Marissa and Ryan and Sandy, you're like, ugh, what are you doing? Uh, I that, know. Like, I don't have a word to describe this episode, but I agree with you, Lou. Uh. Right. No, she makes a really good point. This is a puzzle. And when you're doing long form television, these pieces are, you know, this isn't just a one and done. This is something uh, that really gives these characters so much to do. I mean, it's, we can't have characters all happy, joyous and free and, and, yeah. and unicorns and rainbows and all well, that. That's what all television is supposed to do. Make you go. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it did that. It clearly did that. It made you angry. Um, and then Jason left a voicemail and, um, I just wanted to, uh, share his voicemail as well. Good evening from Dallas, Texas, Melinda. My name is Jason. I am a current Texan, former Ohioan, and originally a Californian. So naturally, I'm a huge fan of the OC, and I'm very excited that you have been taking the podcast beyond Welcome to the OC Bitches, talking about the show itself, and just sharing all of your experiences involved behind the scenes uh, and any facts and insights you provide for longtime fans and for newcomers here who are watching the show for the first time. And this is a very important episode for everybody here. And considering considering the subject matter that it later tackles on, uh, it might leave you know most people very uncomfortable and on edge. That you know beneath all the familiar comedic antics that both Seth Cohen and Ryan Atwood discover here, and the spring break, everybody, uh, it definitely takes a grim turn for the worse uh, in the subplot involving Trey and Marissa. Uh, that happens in this episode, which will eventually evolve into a snowball effect of things to come for the ending of season two. But I'm so happy to share my voice on this podcast. And I want to thank you and everybody who have put this podcast together and be safe out there. Thank you so much for your kind words. Yeah, this is, you know, as he was talking, I was just thinking about the fact that you can feel the excitement in the scripts, in these episodes, they're like, we're going to write this character who's going to come in and do this thing. And it's going to be awful for Marissa and Ryan, but it's going to make great television. And you can feel it. You can feel yeah. the writing. You know, this was one of the storylines, um, even though people still love season one the best. I think season two is one of my, it's my favorite, just because I had a lot more to do. But I think it has so much. But you weren't in this episode. <laughs> I know. Well, I'm not in it, but I still think it, um, but it lends itself to just great. There's great stuff. When you, as an actor, you open those scripts and you're like, this is amazing. I get to do this. Um, so uh, even as painful as it can be sometimes to play these things, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, let's get into the best of with our special fan guest, Molly Gibson. Hi, Molly. Nice Hi. to meet you. you Thank you for joining us. And thank you so much for reaching out. 
Um, you have your own podcast called Confessions of a Millennial Drama Queen. And uh, you, you, you crossed out teenage in your title. Well, mom, there's the movie to confessions yeah. of a teenage drama yeah. queen. Yeah, it's an homage to that movie. And thank you for the plug. That's so nice of you. <laughs> well, yeah, what do you do on your podcast? You can tell the okay. audience here. I We literally, I co-host this podcast. We're talking about early 2000s TV and movies. This is like what I do. This is my shit. Oh, wait, can I swear? Yes, <laughs> yes I've, okay. I've said fuck like eight billion times this episode. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, that's literally what we talk about. And we have guests on like who are relevant for that space. So this is so fun. This is what I do all the time. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So CG doesn't like this episode. Uh, <laughs> and and so I'd be curious to know, is it that you didn't like, it's not that the, it's the writing, you didn't like what the characters were doing, right, CG? I didn't like what the characters were doing. And I didn't, I don't know when this kind of subject matter is like presented like in the early 2000s it's very different than how it was now and I think I really didn't like it like reactions like things I saw on Reddit about the way people reacted to this episode just makes me very frustrated but I guess it also makes me grateful in a way like how much our awareness of things like this has changed but this episode I was pissed off at every single character it's like you all just need to check yourselves because you're all doing bad things, and you all know better. Okay, Molly, what's your take on on the return of the Nana? I don't disagree with you. Like, I was seeing some parallels with Marissa and Kirsten both getting drunk with men they shouldn't be. Um, maybe the reactions that CG you were looking at were, you know, the assault that occurred on Trey's behalf. It was people saying that Marissa led him on. I'm like, oh, yeah. oh, that's okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There are lots of those on Reddit and I, my mom sent me one and then I went down a hole. Oh, Thankfully, no. a lot of the comments on that Reddit post, people are being like, you're a victim blamer. Like, you're not, you're like saying like, you're wrong. But there's a lot of posts saying like, ooh, Melissa, or I keep saying Melissa, Marissa led Trey on. And I'm like, you are so wrong. Yeah. Yeah. That's how they get reactions. True. Yeah. True. Yeah. Do you have, uh, so tell us, what are your thoughts on all of this? Um, what did you have some moments that were? I, I had a lot of moments. Like the writing stood out a lot to me in this episode. Like, yes, there was a lot of problematic things, but also one of my favorite episodes. There was, what I noticed was so many different relationship dynamics and parallels, like all at once, like a lot packed into an episode. Like you have Seth and Summer and they're having issues. Then you have Seth and Zach, or sorry, then you have Summer and Zach. And then you have Marissa Ryan, Marissa Trey, Kirsten Carter. And you're like, this is a lot going on. Like, kudos to the writers. Um, one of my favorite lines um, was at the top when Summer was, like, getting her anger out in the punching bag. Somebody wrote this amazing line. She's like, oh, oh, yeah, because you humiliated me in front of your oh-so-hip, super dorked-out, indie music-loving comic book geeks. Like, first of all, whoever wrote that, I hope they got an immediate raise. Like, bars. Josh. Josh. Probably Josh. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah, the a lot creator. of different lines like that. In this and episode. homage to himself and Brody, actually, <laughs> yeah. probably. Yeah. Because that's yeah. who they were. Totally. Totally. It was yeah. almost like a little Gilmore Girls act. She's like, there was one line, she's like, get all your Cohen-y, Cohen-ish Cohenisms out of your system. Like, th- there was a lot of Very like, Laura like word Gilmore. candy. Yes. Yes. I loved that. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. What did you think about Seth with, the, with his old buddies? I mean, that was probably such a playground for Adam. Cause that was so fun. You could tell he was having so much fun with that. And I'm, I'm guessing he improved a lot in that. In those scenes. He, he did a lot of the physicality was, was improv, the victory lap. And we said, and um, the whole thing, yeah. this, this episode was all about getting him to, uh, to hang out with his old buddies. That's what Josh wanted oh. him to, his, because he, he did that himself with the Nana and um, played shuffleboard. And it was like, oh, okay. a, it was definitely like a Josh experience that he needed on camera. That makes so a lot funny. of sense. Yeah. I know a lot of that Josh was pulling from his own life for, yeah. for that character. Yeah. But yeah. I think <laughs> I could have watched the whole season of him with his old little bridge buddies. <laughs> oh yeah. We were just talking. We're like, how did like, he's like, Oh, longtime friends with his buddies, but we've never seen them go to Florida at all. So we yeah, were like, yeah. they have to have visited Florida and like, non-episodes you know it's you know it's funny i'm I, you know i'll say to the fans i mean i think it's great that we can all point out just the inconsist- inconsistencies in the continuity and such but at least it makes for conversation because josh it probably starts with 
let's do something, you know, like I said, to repeat the success of the Vegas thing and let's do it in Miami and then we can do this and this and, and it just all comes together. And, um, and then, in, you know, the suspension of disbelief is really important here because uh, yeah, all yeah. of a sudden well, you're in Florida. And, and just knowing like how um, most of uh, um, Seth, I keep wanting to say Brody, most of Seth's like life before Ryan was, he, and he didn't have that many friends. I, it was not beyond imagination that he had little buddies. Maybe he called them on the phone once in a while or like wrote him an email. Like I could see that. So we can. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Sent, like know. sending letters yeah. back and forth pen with pals. old men, old pen pals. Yeah. That's right. very sad. <laughs> <laughs> Although they have one of those cricket phones that are, anyway, they probably aren't even doing that. I don't know uh, what you're talking about. So how, wait, I, you seem, you're, you're quite young. And how, how, when did you watch the show? I don't know. Like, when did you discover it? I watched it like a little bit after it was airing. Cause I, so I'm 28. Um, so I watched it. Like, I wish I had seen it when, when I was growing up, my mom probably didn't let me cause it was probably too mature or something, uh-huh. but, um, probably like somewhere in like my late teens, early twenties. And I was kind of like going back to all of these shows that felt really nostalgic to me. And, I started it and then it's never left the rotation like ever. I'll end it and then eventually I'll just start it again. <laughs> really? Yeah. Like, so it is interesting because I, it's not something I would, over the years, I would kind of watch it from time to time. Just, you know. But you were in it, mom. Like, know, you're not going to sit down and be like, ooh, my comfort show is the OC. <laughs> well, I mean, so, but I ne- I'm never, ever, there's n- never bored. You know, you would think it's not like yeah. it, because I discover different things every single time I watch it. And because it's been a while since Rachel and I watched it, you you just I forget things. And like I said, yeah, there's new things every single time. Yeah. Yeah. I there's imagine so many little Easter eggs. It, what is it like 20 years old now? I imagine there's a lot. I mean, I forget things even from a year ago that I watched. Back Season two years. was t- 2019, 20 ish. 21 years That's ago. That's crazy. It does not- no, because season two was 2004. 2004 and five. Yeah. So 20 or 19, not 21. Yeah. Okay. There you go. She, she's <laughs> because it, co- it corresponds with my age. So I know. Right. Oh yes. You're 24. That's true. So this yeah. year it would be. See, mm-hmm. do you have any memories from like when you got, when she was filming or do, were you on set for that? Are you too young? No, no, I was on set. So it were, it filmed from when I was three to seven, Okay. 2003 to 2007. And one, just like one of my most vivid memories is I had this little, I tell this story all the time. I'm riding my little pink Barbie scooter and Adam Brody would steal my scooter oh. and ride it around the hallways of like the dressing rooms and stuff like that and take yes. my scooter. I have a very weird like image in my head of this one hallway. It must have been like nearby your dressing room or something, mom. And him taking my scooter and riding and turning the corner. It's a long hallway. Yeah, yeah sure. really long hallway. And then if, at my mom's house, there's like a OC poster where everyone like signed it and said like, CG, we love you. And Adam wrote, I want my scooter yeah. on the poster. Um, oh my God. And I, I also called action uh, on a scene where mom was making out with Luke. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> well, we, when I was three years old. He was, he was actually just walking out the front of the house. Well, oh, wait, so you had we just actually, finished we, canoodling. No, we maybe did actually. Maybe it was a same. It was like we did kiss and I was like, okay, go. And it was. Oh yeah. God. You were at the motel. Like, action and action. That's a and formative then, memory for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I don't actually remember watching the scene, but I just know that my mom thinks that's so I, funny. The story Great that parenting, I like, mom. The, the story I like to tell is that so CG kept thinking like, Marissa, Misha, Misha's my sister. She just like, Aww. she was young enough to go like, Misha's my sister. And then when Willa Holland came on as the new, as you know, the new Caitlin, CG got really upset one day. She was like, that's no, I'm her sister. That's no. She got <laughs> really angry that. and very upset. Oh my it was God. like a traumatic day. You started crying. I don't remember that. You're like, she's like, who's that? And I'm, like, I'm oh, sure Misha was like, daughter. what the hell? <laughs> No, that's, that's confusing funny. for a kid. Uh, you don't know the difference. There's just all this stuff. Yeah, I don't know why I thought Someone's Misha was actually my, my sister. I don't have a sister anymore. You're like, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Do you have any questions for us? Anything that you would like to ask us? You know, I have a specific question about the episode. And really out of pocket and you may not know the answer, but the scene where they're picking out a movie to watch, Marissa and Trey, and Marissa's like, oh, let's watch The Notebook. It's my favorite movie. And Trey goes, 
oh, I'm more of a shoot 'em up kind of guy. Was this at all an illusion or a foreshadowing to when she literally shoots him up? Or was that totally oh. accidental? Uh. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it's, I wow. guess. I don't know if it was planned, but I, I clocked it and I was like, that would be some very good writing. I wouldn't writing be surprised if, if Josh or Stephanie wanted to throw something in there. Who I don't even know if they had the finale written at this point. But if they did, I wouldn't mm. be surprised if they tried to squeeze it in there. I don't know, mom, you might know better. No, I mean, these are little things that you don't notice that, I mean, it's all plausible that if you bring over the notebook to, although they never really watched it. So, I mean, it, it's not really the, I mean, it's a good, it's a good movie and you mm -hmm. kind of, that's this shows the sweetness and like, Hey, let's watch a, uh, a romance, but I, it's kind of something that a girl would want to do it with a boyfriend or something. Well, no mom, she's not asking about the notebook. Trey says I'm more of a shoot em up. But if a girl does that and brings over the notebook, a guy might go, well, you know, I'm kind of fast cars and shoot em up action. Yeah. But so I took it that way, but I do like that, that, that could very well be that, but the, the that kind of leads me into what my, my music moment, obviously the Miami was fun, but mm -hmm. the gorillas, kids with guns, kids with guns. Oh, doo, doo, I didn't clock kids that. With guns, doo, 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 and they played it multiple times throughout. So oh. I, that's little Easter eggs in there. Mm -hmm. It's, I have a feeling like that's, he's like kids, you know, this, that, that lyric is kids with guns is a, even though it's kind of a cute song, it's kind of a dangerous foretelling. Yeah. Totally. Well, and I'm such a Swifty too. I'm also seeing Easter eggs where they don't exist. So I'm like, oh, is that a clue? I'm like, okay. No, but that's like <laughs> combined with the Kids With Guns song and him saying that, like that yeah. can't be like a coincidence. That's something maybe you ask Josh, mom, and we can yeah. uh, uh, confirm or deny. But that, <laughs> good for picking up on that. When you think about this, Trey is such an important character because – he opens, even though it's a different actor, he opens the pilot. Mm -hmm. He is the one that sent Ryan on this path that ultimately leads him, even though it's the bad path of the, stealing the car and going to jail and juvie and all that. But it's the thing that leads him to the life that he's living now. And mm -hmm. there's something, I don't know, I think it's one of the best storylines of the entire series. And when when we were reading that some people were frustrated that this had to happen to Trey, and it's like, well, you need this character to write these good storylines. Yeah. yeah. When in fact, I think, like you know, our our audience really thought he could be redeemable, and we're sad that he couldn't be. But I think that's that's life. Not everybody's redeemable. But yeah, he started this whole thing, Trey of Ryan ending yeah. up in Newport. He was pivotal in all of that. Well, and it's kind of a common theme in the whole show is they do keep an element, you guys, of like realism, of like not everything's a happy ending. And even though it is a teen drama and it's funny, it's like some people die and some people have drug addiction. Like it's, mm -hmm. that's what kept it grounded. And like, I think people appreciated like the realism of that. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing about like foreshadowing, I don't know if you ever picked up on this, Molly, but like we've just done, we did episode 50 and then now we're doing 49 and in this one we see kirsten take like that big swig of vodka mm -hmm. like and then the last episode we did she finds out like her dad is a scammer and all this stuff and she takes a big swig of whiskey and is drinking a lot and i wonder like every time something bad happens to kirsten it's like you see a glass in her hand that I noticed last episode too. So I'm like, I wonder if Josh and Stephanie knew like, oh, we're going to make Kirsten an alcoholic because every time something bad happens, she has a drink in her hand. Oh, right. Because that doesn't come until later. I Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It hasn't even happened yet. Because a lot of people, I remember when we were shooting that people said, what, all of a sudden she's an alcoholic? And I was like, no, actually, Ooh. all it, this is kind of, there. you can see. This is actually a universal yeah. story where you see, you know, if you go back and watch, she's had, you know, she, she likes her Chardonnay back in Thanksgiving. Remember she was like, she's like, um, I may like my Chardonnay, but at least I didn't, you know, when she screams at her dad. Yeah. So it's always been a theme it, in from the, from the very beginning when Kirsten, uh, and then, and 
that was in the first season. That must so have been planned out always, then as a plot line. Yeah. I think at some point they were like, well, what if we make it, you know, just she's got this habit that turns into something more because of she's not dealing with life in the right way. So mm-hmm. good point, CG. Good point. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, Molly well. got the idea in my head. You're pointing out Easter eggs in this episode. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could <laughs> There's more. There, I mean, there's so many too. There's so many. So yeah. But anyway, what, is there anything else about this episode? I mean, CG, we were talking about just the realism of yeah. the assault that yeah. um, was made. You know, and I think like CG, she'd forgotten, and mm-hmm. it was it was done in such a way that is so plausible and so realistic that you're hanging out with somebody and that you almost trust, but I, I do think that she actually, her, she had a spidey sense that something bad yeah. was happening. Yeah. Well, my question, like, cause my actor brain goes here is like, this is way before intimacy coordinator. So like, how was this handled? Like when you're filming this in 2000, you know, three, four or five, whatever it was. Yeah. Well, if you, like we said, um, I, I have it, I have the page, but, uh, in the OC book, Misha like briefly talks about it. Well, and oh. Stephanie Savage, she said that, um, you know, anything involved in intimacy or violence was making sure one of us was on set, Stephanie, or, you know, talking about how the actors were in charge specifically. You always, mm. like, know that you're, like, you're in charge. Anything you, um, you know, you're respectful to each other. Like, is that okay? You work it out. Mm. You 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 choreograph and, and there is a huge amount of sensitivity around that. Um, I, but I wasn't there, so I can't speak for either one of the actors. Um, but you know, Stephanie made a point of saying that she thought that, um, the actors were really excited for the storyline because it's, it's heavy. And, you know, we, we always want good, good, strong storylines, but then Marissa, uh, Misha indicated that she, there was varying degrees of how comfortable you just never know until you have that experience where you're like, this is what I'm going to do. And you, you can't say no to the script, Oh my gosh. but yeah. then there are times when you walk away going, that was a challenge and I've got to work through some things maybe. Oh yeah. Experience. I mean, yeah, I I've, imagine. I've had scenes that were like, you know, slasher stunt things that left bruises on me. And I was like, would have been nice to have a coordinator for something like this. So I can't even imagine 20 years ago, like it's, it was a whole different oh, really? landscape, but. And yeah, it, it yeah. was filmed very it's, well, it's though. It's interesting yeah. to see, like, or not see, but just think about, like, the progression of, like, how important that is in scenes now totally. or in television and all the intimacy coordinators and everything. And me and my mom were saying at the beginning when we started recording that there's no trigger. Like, we watched this on HBO Max. There's no trigger warning before the episode. Mm-hmm. But I feel like in television now, it's – Trigger warnings before every single episode, whether it's mild violence, nudity, whatever. Good point. No trigger warning or anything before this yep. episode, which I just think it shows how much in 20 years things have changed. Yeah, yeah. drastically, yeah. yeah. Hopefully for the better. I like that, um, you know, stay safe out there, everyone. <laughs> it's not the woman's job to stay safe. It's the no. men's job to not be douchebags. True. Well, and, you know, men are always a th- Afraid of rejection from women, but women are f- afraid that men can kill them. Yeah, slightly different so, yeah. things. <laughs> I was explaining that to one of my guy friends recently. I'm like, yeah, if I'm on a bad date, I'm not going to be like, hey, I'm not enjoying this. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you for dinner, but I'll see you later. I'm going to pretend I'm enjoying it and I'm going to sit to the end and then I'm going to leave and I'll either text you and say I'm not interested or as I'm leaving and you don't know where I live, I'm going to say I'm sorry. I'm not interested. We don't have the luxury of being able to openly do things yeah, like that. That's a smart way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Society. <laughs> yeah. On that note, this guys. Episode on that off. note, Molly, thank you so much you. for um, writing your what lovely email. And, um, you know, I happily... Well, we should come on your podcast. Oh God, we'll do that. We would love that. I know you've asked me and and I didn't quite, I don't know if I, did I get back to you? Like, this is how I'm getting back to you. No, that's okay. We would <laughs> it was love always that. in the, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but no, I wish you all the best. And um, it's a, it's a pleasure to get to know you here. And thank you so much for your insight. And um, you'll probably come back. I don't know. But um, yeah, thank thanks you. Thanks for having me on guys. This was so fun. Thank you so much. Thank you, Molly. Bye. Take Bye. care. You too. Uh-huh. Bye.
Thank you all so much for listening. Please follow, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcast. And be sure to check out my Instagram story as well as our weekly Reddit post to see which episode we're on because we really do need your thoughts, your comments to drive this podcast because the content is all about you guys. Oh, yeah. You can also drop a comment under the YouTube video for this episode on our Beyond the OC channel. Also, next week, it will be Season 3, Episode 17, The Journey. Also, guys, if you want to join us on Patreon, a week after the episode drops, we will be doing live Zooms to discuss the episode. So come on over to Patreon and hang out with us so you can talk about this more. Any questions, comments, or suggestions for the future episodes, our Instagram DMs and comments are also open. Like I, or like my mother said, her Instagram story, she'll post about it. Her Instagram is at the Melinda Clark, and my Instagram is at CGMIR. You can send us DMs. Um, if for some reason you can't find the Reddit or something, uh, you're always welcome to reach out to us there, and maybe we'll use your comment or question in the episode. Uh, you can also follow both of us on TikTok. She is also at the Melinda Clark, and I am at CGMIR. If you have something to say, if you want your voice heard, please go to speakpipe.com slash OC bitch to let us know why and what makes it your favorite. Do you have a favorite line, a favorite scene? We might play your voicemail live on the show and discuss it. So leave a voicemail. <laughs> we also have a Gmail account. <laughs> There's a lot of places to find us. Email us. Leave beyond a voicemail. Send us OC. DMs. Comment on YouTube. Do all these things. It's it's beyond the OC podcast at gmail.com. Got com. Let me I say think that again. I'm losing my mind. Beyond the OC podcast at gmail.com. And with that, all I have to say is bye, bye bitches. bitches.